This is day one of the 2023 Mid-Atlantic Christadelphian Bible School. Our third speaker this morning is Brother Roger Lewis from the Christ Church North New Zealand Ecclesia. The theme for Brother Roger's classes this week is Philip the Evangelist. Today's class is entitled The Appointment of the Seven. Brother Roger. Well, thank you, Brother Ken, and good morning, my dear brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ. A character study, oh, that's always a good thing, isn't it? And perhaps one of the interesting things about our study in this last session, Philip the Evangelist, is that we're really looking at someone who was remarkably influential in the first century, and yet we feel as if we know almost nothing about him. Perhaps one of the most interesting things about this man is that he, he trod the streets of Israel at the same time as the apostles. He crossed paths, we believe, with Peter and Paul on more than one occasion. But he was a lesser light. He wasn't Peter. He wasn't Paul. But there's something very comforting about the story of Philip the Evangelist because it shows us that God works with all his servants and that we all have a part to play in his service if we're ready for it and we surrender to his will. So, so in terms of, of what we're going to look at this morning then, is, as our brother chairman has announced, the title for this morning is The Appointment of the Seven. And that brings us to Acts chapter 6 because it's in Acts chapter 6 that Philip will first appear in the divine record and I think in a very crucial context that will help us to understand who the man was. And it's in Acts chapter 6, not only that will he be introduced, but we will grasp perhaps the spirit of what he would continue to do uh, as the Acts of the Apostles unfold. Now, do you notice what it says in Acts chapter 6 and verse 1? It says, in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied. You see, the, the book of the Acts has already reported on the rapid growth of the Jerusalem ecclesia. Do you remember we're told in Acts 2 verses 41 and 47 these words? It says, the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And verse 47 says, And the Lord added to the ecclesia daily such as should be saved. These are big numbers, brothers and sisters, much bigger than our ecclesial preaching efforts seem to be able to produce. In Acts 4 verse 4 it says, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 14 it says, By the hands of the apostles were many signs, and believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes, both of men and women. So that by the time we come here to Acts chapter 6 verse 1 that says, In those days when the number of disciples was multiplied, we get some idea of just how large this ecclesia must have been. And it was in that very growth that the seeds of the problem would now emerge, as the record is going to tell us here in this first verse. Because the record says that in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there was a murmuring, the record says. You see, with such an enormous number in the ecclesia, the problem of welfare provision was very significant. You see, in an era of no state support, Communities had to provide for themselves. Now, in the land of Israel, in, sec in first century times, the Jewish welfare program was administered through the synagogue system. And they did take care of the widows and the fatherless. And they probably did a good job. They had a whole system of welfare inside the synagogue system so that those in need might in some way be provided for Jewish welfare. But you see, when a believer joined the ecclesia and became a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, they were excommunicated from the synagogue. And with that expulsion, they were also cut off from all welfare support. 
and widows especially were in a difficult position. No husband, sometimes no children, no resources, and without representation, without protection, they were very, very vulnerable as a community because they were so dependent on the goodness and the kindness of others And if there were thousands already in this ecclesia, then it must have been a very large problem indeed when the number of the disciples was multiplied. And it wasn't just a problem of multiplication, was it? Because do you see what the verse says? There arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because uh, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Now, we've got to be careful here because the word Grecians here, Hellenistes, means Greek-speaking Jews as opposed to Aramean, Aramaic-speaking Jews. So the word Greeks in the New Testament, Hellens, means all nations who were not Jews. But the word Grecians here is not the same word, and it actually refers to Jewish people who spoke the Greek language. All the widows of Acts 6 verse 1 were Jewish, but some spoke Hebrew and some spoke Greek. And because they spoke in a different tongue, you see, they might not have been able to properly communicate their needs. So here was a division based on language which led to discrimination. You know, growth in an ecclesia brings its own special problems. When an ecclesia begins, when it starts and it's small, there's a real sense of intimacy with smaller numbers the ability for pastoral care in an ecclesia which is small is good. But as the numbers increase, the ability to manage all that diminishes. Perhaps I could give you an illustration from my own ecclesia. The meeting that we joined in Christchurch when we arrived there had 40 members. It's a funny thing, you know, about numbers, but when we arrived on a Sunday... You, could, you felt as if you were visiting with about 10 different families because you'd speak to that brother there and that sister there and that son there and actually by the time you, you'd gone home, you'd pretty much had contact with most of the other members family-wise of that group of 40. But you see, our ecclesia grew from 40 to 60 and then from 60 to 80, from 80 to 100, from 100 to 120. And the strange thing is that when it got to 120, you would speak with two people after the meeting, not 10. It's almost as if the bigger the ecclesia, the less people you speak to. Something about how we function as people. The larger the number, we somehow zoom down to less. There's real problems with large numbers. So what we did was we split the ecclesia, amicably of course, into two groups. And those two groups have now since continued to grow and it was such a good decision to make at the time. But you see, what we learn here in Acts chapter 6 is that unless steps are taken to address such needs, even an ecclesia that was being shepherded by the apostles could run into difficulties. What they didn't know at this moment is that the events of this episode in the ecclesia's history in Acts 6 would become a starting point for dramatic changes that would sweep the truth outwards from Jerusalem in ever widening circles until it reached Rome itself. And in one of those circles, sweeping out from Jerusalem, in one of those circles we will find Philip, who will be critically involved but he's introduced into our attention for the first time in the story in Acts 6. So what did the apostles do then? What did they do about this problem? Well, it says in verse 2, it says, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them. So you see, whoever might have been involved in the problem, the ultimate responsibility for guidance rested with the apostles as the elders of the ecclesia. The murmuring obviously reached their ears, so they did something about it. They responded. But you see what they did? They called a special meeting of the ecclesia, and they laid the issue before the whole congregation. Part of the problem lay in the sheer size of the ecclesia and the administrative burdens that that must have brought. See, ecclesias don't operate by accident, It's Brother Roberts, isn't it, that says in the Ecclesial Guide that when an ecclesia is small, 
He says few and simple rules might suffice, but as an ecclesia grows, those rules become inadequate. So the apostles acknowledged the need, but they felt that it was not appropriate to be distracted from their own apostolic duties in the process. So what they said, verse 2, is to the disciples, they said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Rotterham says it doth not seem right. The New American Standard Bible says it is not desirable. Diglot says it is not proper. What they were really saying is that they found it impossible to fulfill both the spiritual and the practical duties of care because their responsibilities as apostles demanded absolutely all of the commitment that they could give. And what was that, what was that commitment that they had as apostles? That we should serve the word their job, their task, was to teach and preach the Word. See, that's what Mark 16 had said to them. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then it says, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the Word, it says, with signs following. Mark 16, verse 20. And likewise, in the record of, of Acts, just a little bit further back, in Acts chapter 4, we're told in verse 31 that they spake the word of God with boldness. That was the work of the apostles, you see. And yet the funny thing is that even though they said it's our job to preach the word, it turns out, as events transpired, that Philip, one of the very men selected to free them from practical responsibilities, is going to go on to become one of the most extraordinary preachers of all time. But only after the Spirit had prepared him, and it's the story of his preparation that Acts chapter 6 is going to reveal as Philip appears. So this is what the apostles said, verse 3. They said, look, we can't leave the word of God. Wherefore, brethren, verse 8, look ye out among you seven men. So those chosen were to be drawn uh, from the ranks of the ecclesia, but they were to be drawn by the ecclesia itself. Look ye out among you. Now that's surprising when you think about it, because you see, the apostles had the gift of spirit insight. They had the ability to discern character. Why couldn't they just choose the people? Wouldn't they have done a better job? But no, they said, no, 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 we want the ecclesia to make the decision. And you see, not only did this help members to feel that they'd been fully involved, that they'd been properly consulted in selecting suitable brethren, but it affirmed the principle of ecclesial responsibility for both the problem and the solution. And there's something about the mechanism of ecclesial life here that Brother Roberts is very clear, clear in the ecclesial guide when he says, arranging brethren are the servants of the ecclesia. They act as the instruments of the ecclesia. They act on behalf of the ecclesia, but never in place of the ecclesia. And therefore, the business meetings that ecclesias have the precise reason for business meetings that ecclesias have are so that the arranging brethren can present back to the ecclesia for their approval the decisions that the arranging brethren have only taken on their mutual behalf. And at those business meetings, when we consent to the findings of the arranging brethren's minutes and the decisions they've made, we have taken ownership for ourselves as an ecclesia of what they've done for us. That's exactly what the apostles do here. Did you notice that? They didn't establish a hierarchy of rulership. They laid the burden on the ecclesia. They said, is this a problem in the meeting? Then let the meeting solve the problem. Ah, but they'd all have to exercise their powers of judgment in the matter, and the apostles would make sure that they still acted wisely. Look ye out from among you seven men. Well, that's obviously a representative number, isn't it? That the seven would represent the whole meeting on this particular matter. Seven is symbolic in that sense. It's used that way in 2 Samuel 21, verse 6, in Proverbs 26 and verse 16, in Jeremiah 52, verse 25. Seven men is typical of the whole. And this is what Josephus says. He said, Let there be seven men to judge in every city. 
and these such as have been before most zealous in the exercise of virtue and righteousness. So seven men was something that was known as a Jewish custom and practice and drawn from Old Testament teaching and passages. But now the verse will give us the credentials of the seven brethren, the qualifications of the candidates to be chosen. So do you notice again what the apostles did? You say that they asked the ecclesia to make the selection, but it was the apostles that said, these are the criteria you must use. They set the criteria for choice. And what were they? Well, says the record, they must be men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So, so three things, you see. Now, that first one, honest report, is really, I think, saying that the brethren had to be of good character and of good standing in the ecclesia, confirmed by public testimony. Let me just give you two or three other references that you might like to make a note of in that regard. It says of Timothy, young Timothy, in Acts 16 verse 2, that he was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra. We're told again in Acts chapter 12, 22 and verse 12, one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews that dwelt there. And again in the first of Timothy chapter 3 and verse 7 concerning deacons, it says, moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without. That's the bishops, actually. So, so this was one of the principles here that the apostles said should be a criteria for selection in Acts chapter 6. Men of, of honest report. And the second thing that they said that these men must exhibit was that they ought to be full of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't think, brothers and sisters, that on this occasion, I don't think it's referring to the Holy Spirit power for miraculous purposes so much as to a strong understanding of scriptural truth. And what's interesting, in the list of spirit gifts in the first of Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 8, it says, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom and to another the word of knowledge. And I think it was that type of spiritual quality that these men needed for their work. They needed good spiritual minds for the work they were about to engage in. A good grasp of scriptural principles. And lastly, says the record, they must be men of wisdom. Because you see, the particular responsibilities that were going to be given to these seven men would demand the wisdom of tact, the wisdom of sympathy, the wisdom of organization, the wisdom of care. So here then were the key virtues that these brethren needed to exhibit. They needed to have a good report by public testimony. They needed to have a good grasp of the truth. And they needed to have sufficient discernment to handle problems of ecclesial welfare in a gracious, in a sensitive way. You see, they were being chosen for a practical task, but their qualifications needed to be spiritual. Now, do you know that that principle was captured by Brother Robert Robertson enshrined in our ecclesial guide? Because this is what he says in Clause 19 about qualifications for serving brethren. He says, in this delegation of official duties, it ought to be guided by the apostolic principle that men of suitable qualifications should be chosen. That's an echo, is it not, of the very spirit here of Acts chapter 6. Seven men, but with these qualifications. And Brother Roberts goes on to say, it's important that the men to whom a special function is assigned by choice should be men likely to exercise a righteous and beneficial influence. If Paul was careful to recommend that candidates should have certain eligible qualifications, much more needful is it that regard should be had to these qualifications in appointments in a day like ours when we're not privileged with the visible indications of the mind of the Spirit. If it was needed in those days, said Robert Roberts, how much more in our day that those qualifications be carefully sought 
in appointments to be made on behalf of the ecclesia. And again, in clause 23 of the ecclesial guide, Brother Robert says, there must be arrangement and it must be the work of some in particular. And then he says, strange, isn't it? Seven is a convenient and scriptural number for purpose of management. Do you think Robert Roberts might have read Acts chapter 6, brothers and sisters? I'm sure he had, you see, in his thinking on these matters. And so he goes on to say their function would be to attend to all business matters connected with the operations of the ecclesia. Their qualifications would principally require to be of a practical order, but arranging, brethren, he says, ought above all things to be men of a brotherly spirit. Is it not observed in the man's conduct? Then he's not a brotherly man and not suitable for management, however great his practical abilities might be. So you see, in these clauses, Brother Roberts laid down that the appointment of serving brethren should follow the principle seen here in Acts chapter 6, that even brethren selected for administrative or practical tasks must first and foremost exhibit the spiritual qualifications of a brotherly spirit and a godly mind if ecclesial life is to be conducted wisely and well. I think the apostles got it right, don't you think, brothers and sisters? They asked the ecclesia to make decisions, but they said, you'll follow our criteria. And I think that they were, were very wise criteria that the that the apostles laid down on this occasion. And in the meantime, they said, Acts 6 verse 4, we, we the apostles, well, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now, that word continually, incidentally, indicates the commitment of the apostles to the essential ingredients of ecclesial life. And you notice that one of those was prayer. That word continual, proskatereo, means constant attention. So they said, we want to give constant attention to prayer in the ecclesia. And there's a set of passages that say that, incidentally. Continual prayer, Acts 1 verse 14. Continual prayer, Acts 2 verse 40, 42. Continual prayer here in Acts 6 verse 1. Continual prayer, Romans 12 verse 12. Continual prayer, Colossians 4 verse 2. It was so important that everything in ecclesial life was governed by the spirit of intense and fervent prayer to the Father that his blessing might rest upon all the arrangements. And we will give ourselves to that, said the apostles, and to the ministry of the word. So the primary work of the apostles related to the diakonia of the word, as that phrase is, as distinct from the diakonia of the tables, verse 2. So you see, both roles were a service in the truth. But the work of preaching Christ, well, that was a specific charge to the apostles that they were not able to let go of. So the apostles for spiritual nourishment and gospel proclamation and other faithful brethren for practical administration and care. Well, verse 5 says that the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Paramanas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Do you know something interesting, brothers and sisters? All seven names, they're all Greek, every one of them. They're all Greek names. I think they're all Greek brethren. Uh, Greek-speaking Jews. And if that was true, then the implication is that the Hebrew brethren had given them responsibility to administer the distribution of verse 1. Is there a problem here concerning Greek-speaking widows being neglected? Then we'll appoint seven Greek-speaking brothers to deal with it. Now, wasn't that a good spirit? Wasn't that an excellent spirit? It was a marvelous example of ecclesial trust. But it also suggests, don't you think, that these, these seven must have been outstanding brethren for the Hebrew Jews of the Ecclesia to place confidence in them that they might administer all of the administration, both for the Greek and Hebrew-speaking widows. So out of all the thousands in Jerusalem, just these seven men are about to be selected 
So they all must have possessed the qualities of verse 3. Philip included. So the moment, from the moment we're introduced to him, Philip is singled out as a man of good reputation. He's of honest report. Of clear scriptural understanding. He's full of the Holy Spirit. And he's a man of considerable tact. He's described as one of wisdom. And incidentally, if you're not sure, let me reassure you at this moment that the Philip of Acts 7 and verse 5 who's one of the seven, is so named in this way to distinguish him from the Philip who's one of the twelve. There is Philip an apostle, but this is not this man. The one who's of the seven is not the Philip of the twelve. So this Philip, who later will become Philip the Evangelist, is a different man altogether. But right from the beginning, brothers and sisters, he possesses special qualities that out of all the thousands in the meeting, these seven are going to be chosen. And he's not just chosen, he's high on the list. Did you notice, assuming they're being named by the ecclesia as bringing suitable candidates to mind, choose you from among you seven men. Well, said the congregation, uh, Stephen should be on the list, says one, and Philip, says another. He's right up there. Right up there at the forefront of their minds that this is one of the brethren who should be chosen. Philip. And yet the strange thing is that although seven outstanding men are chosen and named and appointed, we'll only ever hear of two of them again. Only two will have their exploits recorded in the scroll of the book. So Stephen and Philip are the most notable of the seven, but they were all faithful men. So five excellent brothers who labored in the truth have nothing recorded of them. It sort of puts our own labors in the truth in perspective, doesn't it, brothers and sisters? I'm not at all sure that our lifetime of service in the truth would necessarily even rate a line in the Spirit's ledger. But lest we be disheartened by that, we remind ourselves that the Word is devoted to the unfolding of the Father's plan and not the achievements of men. So you see, the inclusion of any man or woman in Scripture is only insofar as they are pertinent to the deity's purpose. And if they are, they're there. And it doesn't mean that there weren't many other faithful brothers and sisters who labored all their lives in the service of God. Their absence from the record is no indication of their godliness of character. And on this occasion, we'll hear of two more of these, or hear of two of these again, but none of the others. And I wonder whether one of the reasons why Stephen and Philip will be singled out for special attention is because of something that we observe in Hebrews 11. Now, we shan't turn it up, but you might remember that the end of the catalogue of all the the examples of faith in Hebrews 11, that right in the last few verses, it talks about two categories in particular. Those in Hebrews 11, verses 33 to 35, who we might describe as faith's conquerors. And those in Hebrews 11, verses 35 to 38, who were faith's sufferers. But they were both examples of faith. But it was a faith outworked in different dimensions. And I think that we have that in our own ecclesial experiences, do we not? Some whose faith is marked by the degree of their work in the truth. And others whose faith is marked by their degree of suffering in the truth. They're both models to inspire others. And it may be that we don't always get to choose which of those two we will be. But God knows. Now let me show you that in the lives of these two men and see whether you think that it might be so that they're chosen for this reason. Because You see, of Stephen, we're told in Acts chapter 6, verses 7 and 8 and verse 13, that his center of activity was limited to just one place. 
he was in Jerusalem. But of Philip, we will find that his sphere of endeavor was extended to many cities. Of Stephen, we will learn in Acts 6, verses 8 to 9, that his wonders and miracles led to strong opposition. But of Philip, we will learn in Acts 8, verses 12 to 13, that his signs and miracles led to earnest belief. Of Stephen, we will find in Acts 7, verse 54 and verse 58, that his testimony filled his hearers with absolute rage. But of Philip, we will learn in Acts 8, verses 8 and 39, that his preaching moved his listeners to thanks. Of Stephen, we will learn in Acts 7, verses 59 to 60, that his ministry terminated in a premature death. But of Philip, we will find that his ministry in chapter 21, verses 8 to 9, extended over many peaceful years. And of Stephen, we will learn in Acts 7, verse 57, that his message ended with failure and rejection. Because Acts 7, verse 57 says, they ran upon him with one accord. But of Philip, it will be said in Acts 8, verse 6, that his teaching resulted in success and acceptance because the record says, and the people with one accord gave heed. And the Spirit, I think, selected two men here who labored side by side as dear friends, but with very different stories in their lives. In the providence of God, it was so. And they'd both be examples to others. What we're called upon, brothers and sisters, in whatever happens to us in life, is to trust in the Father's hand and to seek to be faithful before him. Whichever of those two might come upon us. So they chose these seven, says Acts 6. And in the sixth verse, it says that having done that, they set them before the apostles. So you see, although the whole ecclesia had selected the seven, the choice was still subject, as it were, to apostolic approval and apostolic appointment. And that's what they did, because the verse goes on to say, when they prayed, well, I think that's the apostles, you see, when they prayed, or they prayed. Remember they said, we'll give ourselves the continual prayer? They prayed about everything, the apostles. Now, you see, the, the apostles didn't trust in their own personal powers of assessment. They had spirit insight, but they still asked for heaven's guidance on this matter. And heaven might have replied by imparting some form of gift to indicate God's acceptance of these chosen. So having prayed, the record says, verse 6, they laid their hands on them. Now, just stop and think about it. Philip, with the rest of the seven is already full of the Holy Spirit, verse 3. He doesn't need the apostles to impart the Holy Spirit to him. He's already got it. So what was the laying on of hands about? Well, the answer, I suggest, is that to place hands upon the candidate was a, a, an act symbolic of appointing them to office. The laying on of hands was not always for the passing on of the Spirit. It was sometimes to confirm someone's appointment to office. It's used that way in Acts 13, verse 3. And again, in the first of Timothy, chapter 5, and verse 22. And I suggest here in Acts chapter 6 and verse 6 also. They were appointing them now to this office. Perhaps they did receive the gift of miracles as God's endorsement of their selection. We, we certainly know that later in Acts 6 verse 8 that Stephen would perform miracles and that Philip later in Acts 8 verse 6 would also perform miracles. So these two manifested the gift of, of miraculous healing uh, in their work later on. So what was the result then of all this activity and decision-making by the ecclesia and the apostles in conjunction. Well, verse 7 says, the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Wasn't that where the problem began? Mother and sisters, the multiplication of the ecclesia, look what happens. The ecclesia explodes yet again after this matter has been dealt with. But you see, the result of the solution proposed by the apostles was that this problem was never heard of again. 
Or they still had needs, but there was no neglect. They did it once, and they did it well. And not only was the problem resolved, but as we can see, the ecclesia and the truth itself continued to prosper. So here's the question, of course. How was it that the apostles, do you think, could deal with this issue so effectively? Because they did a splendid job, really, didn't they? How was it that they were able to do that? Well, we know why, and we know how. They opened their Bibles. They opened their Bibles to deal with this issue, and they looked for a scriptural answer to the problem. And the question they asked was this, and it's a question that every set of arranging brethren should ask every time a problem occurs in ecclesial life. Has this ever happened before in the Bible record, and what did they do about it then? We go back to the Scriptures to find our guidance, and that's what we need to do in ecclesial life. Bibles should always be open at ecclesial business meetings and at arranging brethren's meetings. I believe, and it's obvious to say this, brothers and sisters, I know, but I want to say it, I don't believe there is any problem in our ecclesial or personal life that's not answered somewhere in Scripture. There isn't a problem that you can have that's not answered somewhere in the Word of God. Our task is to find that passage. And so it is in ecclesial life. And when we do, and if we do, then what happens is we, we come to, to the absolutely perfect answer because now we're looking at it through God's spectacles of what God thinks and what God teaches and what God requires. Now, can I just say something? The apostles didn't find a Bible passage on how to manage the difficulty of welfare administration in the complexity of a multilingual setting. There weren't any Bible passages on that subject. But you see, that was a symptom. And one of the lessons is that when we're dealing with problems, we ought to not be distracted by symptoms. We need to say, what's the problem? Have we discovered the real problem? And I think that's what the apostles did. They said, what's the problem here? Then they looked for scriptural answers. And they found an excellent biblical answer to the real problem in their day. In fact, they found just the right passage the perfect passage, which showed them exactly what to do. We know that, brothers and sisters, well, so we see why they know that. Uh, if you come to Acts chapter 6 in your right hand, so you're already there, but just pop your hand in as a marker and come back with your left hand, how wonderfully to be digitally dexterous in both sides. We're told in Deuteronomy chapter 1, these words, Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 9, and here's what the record says. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 9 says, Moses said, I spake unto you at that time, saying, I'm not able to bear you myself alone, which is pretty much probably how the apostles felt in Acts chapter 6. But let's just see how that plays out, because, you see, I think that the apostles, first of all, distinguished between the symptom and the problem, then opened their Bibles to find where that had happened before and what had been done, and they found the answer in Deuteronomy chapter 1, as we've suggested. So notice the key links here that tell us that we've come to the right passage. I think we've come to the very passage that the apostles based their decision on in Acts chapter 6. Because you see, Deuteronomy chapter 10 says, verse 10, Yahweh your God hath multiplied you. And ye are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. And the apostles said, that's it, that's, that's it, that's our problem, because Acts chapter 6 verse 1 says, it came to pass when the number of the disciples was multitude, multiplied, and the saying, verse 5, pleased the whole multitude. They said, we're in exactly the same position that Moses was in Deuteronomy chapter 1. So Moses was guiding the nation at a time when it had greatly multiplied, and he faced the same difficulties. And so, having found what Moses did, we believe that the apostles had the same response as Moses. So, what Moses says in verse 12 of Deuteronomy 1, he says, How can I myself alone bear your cumbrance and your burden and your strife? You see, Moses felt that the burden was beyond his capacity to manage. And so did the apostles in Acts 6 verse 2. They said, it's not reason for, for us to leave the word of God. We can't do this and serve tables. We can't do it all. So the apostles felt that same inability to handle everything that needed attention. 
And if they were in the identical predicament to Moses, then what better response could they give but to suggest the same solution as Moses? So what did Moses suggest? Well, do you notice what he says, verse 13? He says, take you from among you. That's exactly what the apostles will say in Acts 6 verse 3. Look ye out from among you. You choose, said Moses. You choose, said the apostles. Look ye out from among you. And so they placed the task of selecting the candidate back on the ecclesia just as Moses had done. And in that way the ecclesia felt, well, they felt consulted but now they're going to be joined in the responsibility of how it works out because the choice was theirs. Ah, but before they chose, Moses said, well, um, I, I might just set some criteria for you, says Moses. Verse, um, verse 13, he said, um, I think they should be wise men. They should be men of understanding, he says, and they should be known among the tribes. But you see, isn't that exactly what the apostles say in Acts chapter 6 verse 3? You should choose men of wisdom and men full of the Holy Spirit and men of honest rapport. So you see, I think what we've got is the same three criteria, incidentally, but they're reversed. I think the apostles took Moses' three criteria, but reversed them. There's probably a reason for that, don't you think? So there's something worth thinking about. Why did the apostles decide to reverse Moses' criteria? So how did the ecclesia in the time of Moses react to his suggestion? Well, Deuteronomy 1 verse 14 says, they said, the thing which thou hast spoken is good for us to do. That's a good idea, they said. And isn't that exactly what happens in, in, uh, in Acts chapter 6? Because we're told in Acts 6 verse 5, the saying pleased the multitude. They said that's a good idea to the apostles. And so based on that response, Moses took their selection and appointed them, says Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 15. So I took them and I made them chiefs over them. And that's exactly what's going to happen in Acts chapter 6. It says the apostles laid their hands on them. Do you think that's where the apostles got their thinking from? I'm certain, brothers and sisters. I think that they reversed the order, incidentally, because, because of the sensitivity and delicacy of looking after the widows and the needy in the administration of Acts 6 verse 1, that they decided that the most important criteria was that they be of honest report that they were so well known amongst the congregation that their decisions would be respected. So they decided, did the apostles, that they would make that criteria to perhaps be the most important of all. And, and while we're still in Deuteronomy and before you leave it, at the exhortation of Moses to the men he appointed in his day, I think it would be the very spirit that would be needed to be shown by the seven in Acts chapter 6, because this is what it says, this is what Moses said to these people in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, I charged your judges at that time, saying, hear the causes between your brethren, and judge righteously between every man and his brother and the stranger that is with you. Ye shall not respect persons in judgment, but ye shall hear the small as well as the great. Ye shall not be afraid for the face of man, for the judgment is God's. And the cause that is too hard for you, bring it unto me and I will hear it. And I think that this whole account of the appointment of the seven in Acts chapter 6 will be to ask these brethren to show that same caring and diligent spirit without respect to persons. And as a result of that, the apostles enjoyed good success in the activities of ecclesial life. Now I think this whole story in Acts 6, brothers and sisters, I think that one of the key reasons for this story about the appointment of the seven is to introduce Philip to us because of the role he's going to play in the Acts of the Apostles. We don't know it yet, but the Spirit's preparing us for his work by means of this very first story of his appearance. Because you see, here he is, 
for the first occasion, he's going to be introduced to us as who? Why, as Philip, the careful minister of tables. That will be his first ecclesial role. So as one of the seven, he's appointed to the ministry of tables in contrast to the twelve who are given to the ministry of the word. So this was a practical work. He was going to provide in those more mundane things of life. But you see, Philip's spirit of service, even in those mundane matters, was going to be performed with such diligence and with such care that the work of the truth in that ecclesia was going to prosper. Proverbs 22 says, does it not, verse 29, Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before obscure men. I think that was Philip's spirit from the very outset, a man diligent in his business. And Luke 16 verse 10 reminds us, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in that which is much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in the much. In, 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 in much. And part of the lesson here, brothers and sisters, therefore, is that in ecclesial life, we're appointed, first of all, to those matters of service that we're perhaps competent to fulfill, but they will be rewarded with greater responsibilities in the truth service if we attend to those smaller tasks with the right spirit of care. Even that which is small or menial should be accomplished to the best of our ability. Everything we do in the Lord's service is a training ground for our spiritual development. And when we're ready, when we've learned the lesson, God can lift us into the next sphere of labor that he wishes for us to accomplish on his behalf. And I think Philip was one of those men who learned the lessons well of what God had asked him first to do. He said, first thing you need to learn, Philip, is to look after widows, to look after those in need. And Philip didn't realize at this time that that was a complete preparation for his future work in the truth. It's a good spirit to have, especially when we're young in the truth to accept whatever tasks we're asked to perform and to do them both cheerfully and well. You see, if we learn that spirit, we will be, I think, developed in our service before God. So here's Philip, the helpful provider for widows. He was taking on that which in the book of the law was the special charge of Yahweh himself. And isn't it James that says that pure religion and undefiled is this to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction? And that's what Philip was first asked to do, you see, to take up that spirit which was of Almighty God himself. So this is his first duty in ecclesial life. He was to show the spirit of care for others in need, irrespective of any difference in their background or language or culture and to show that care without respect of persons and with righteous impartiality as the spirit of Deuteronomy chapter 1 had required back in the days of Moses. So you just imagine, if you were put in charge of looking after the widows, how easy it would have been to be abrupt, how easy to be officious, how easy to stir anxiety in those that come dependent upon you for provision or even worse, to make them feel indebted to you for their welfare. You see, the very work that Philip would later perform and that would make him famous, I think depended on how well he would learn the lessons of this episode in his life. And what he needed to learn was the spirit of his Lord. A man who performed all his labors with such passion and care that the smallest detail received attention, that the mundane could be invested with the spiritual possibilities of noble service. A man who cared for widows, who taught and touched with no respect of persons, but with loving concern for all. A man, in short, who was all that Philip yearned to be. And in the story of the evangelist, we're going to recognize the spirit of Christ made manifest in his disciple to encourage us to walk in the footsteps of our Lord as well. So did he learn to be that careful minister of tables, that helpful provider for widows? Well, that, brothers and sisters, is the subject of our next study.